the panelists for the session that I would like to invite on stage, Mr. William Dalrymple, Ms. Anjum Katyal, Ms. Nirmala Lakshman, and our moderator, Mr. Vikram Sampath. Literature festivals provide an opportunity for us to disappear into our favorite world of books and stories, myths and legends, writers and their fans. William Dalrymple is an award-winning historian and writer, art historian and curator, as well as a prominent broadcaster and critic. He is also one of the co-founders and co-directors of the annual Jaipur <laughs> Literature Festival. Mr. Dalrymple's interests include the history and art of India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, the Middle East, the Muslim world, Hinduism, Buddhism, the Jains, and early Eastern Christianity. All of his seven books have won major literary prizes, as have his radio and television documentaries. Ms. Anjum Katyal has been involved with theatre publishing for decades as an editor, writer, translator, and critic. Apart from theatre in particular, she has worked on publications on Indian arts and culture and has been involved in organizing several exhibitions of contemporary art. She has a background in education and teacher training. A published poet, she also sings the blues and reviews and writes on theater and the visual arts. Nirmala Lakshman is a journalist and director of the Hindu group of publications. She was joint editor of The Hindu and has held senior editorial positions at the newspaper for more than three decades. Nirmala founded and edited the Hindu Literary Review and conceptualized and created Young World, India's only children's newspaper supplement at the time. She launched and curated the Hindu's literary festival, Lit for Life, and initiated the annual prize for best fiction from the Hindu. Nirmala has a PhD in postmodern fiction from Madras University and a master's degree in English from the United States. She is the editor of an anthology of contemporary Indian journalism, Writing a Nation. Our moderator for this session is our fearless founder and the face of the Bangalore Literature Festival, Vikram Sampath. He's the author of three acclaimed books, Splendors of Royal Mysore, My Name is Gohar Jan, and Voice of the Veena. He has received several awards, including the Sahitya Academy Yuva Puraskar and the ARSE International Award for Excellence in Historical Research and Music. He is passionate about preserving India's cultural history and musical heritage through the archive of Indian music. And I'd like the moderator to continue with the session. Very good morning, everyone. Uh, a disclaimer first, I, I had nothing to do with that adjective that was added of being a fearless founder. But then uh, I think that is one word that describes all of us here. Uh, and we need to really be quite fearless, quite thick-skinned to actually attempt to put together something like a literature festival. Either fearless uh, or foolish, Samvikram. <laughs> Well, we'll, we'll decide that by the end of the <laughs> discussion. But I thought, you know, what better place to discuss about a literature festival at a literature festival itself. And uh, so it's, it's a great honor and pleasure to have all these great, uh, you know, curators of literature festivals who have scripted great successes uh, in the festivals that they have founded. And we uh, at the Bangalore Literature Festival are the new kid on the block. And we thought, in the process, we'll also probably steal a few secrets from all the others. I will probably begin with, uh, and, and I'm sure in the audience, a lot of you would be lovers of literature festivals. That's why you've gathered here uh, on a Saturday morning. But then I'm sure there would be several of you who are probably also skeptic about lit fest. Quite a few are cynical about, about it. And for those of you who hate literature festivals, the one man you should probably blame is the one sitting right next to me, uh, William Dalrymple, because he started it all. Uh, and I remember reading uh, what you had said about let a million flowers bloom. Um, and the, the prophecy did come true with uh, regard to Lit Fest in India. And we have festivals that have mushroomed in almost every city in the country, and rightfully so. So William, I'll start with you, uh, you know, about how did this entire idea of the Jaipur Lit Fest, which is now touted as the greatest literary feat in the world uh, by Tina Brown, uh, how did this idea come up? Uh, take us through the genesis, because I also remember you uh, mentioning somewhere in the, that in the very first year, you had about a, f a handful of people who lost their way and they didn't know what to do, and out of curiosity, they just landed uh, in the festival. From then, and seven years down, uh, you've had about one and a half lack, two lakh, footfalls, I think, in this edition. 
So take us through the journey of the Jaipur Lit Fest. I think the <coughs> ball really started rolling um, internationally um, with a friend of mine who was at my year uh, at Cambridge uh, called Peter Florence, who started the Hay Festival um, in about 1989, I think. And it was uh, Hay on Y, a tiny village in the middle of nowhere in Wales. Uh, it takes at least three and a half, four hours to get to from London. Um, but it has somehow, uh, by some quirk of evolution, uh, got something like 150 second-hand and first-hand bookshops in it. Um, and uh, this tiny, very beautiful village, um, Peter decided it would be the venue for a literary festival. It was the most unlikely um, uh, kickoff. But he got all the big publishers in London interested and started hosting very quickly names of the stature of Salman Rushdie and Gabriel Garcia Marquez. And Garcia Marquez had actually flown in by helicopter from Heathrow, which, uh, and that got headlines in itself. And that started a, a thing in the, in the 1980s, where quite suddenly, uh, as has happened in India in the last five, six years, every village, every town, every provincial center wanted to have their own literary festival. And literary festivals are quite easy to pull off relative to, say, rock festivals or, uh, or other things, in that writers are quite cheap. <laughs> in, fact, in fact, they're so desperate to, uh, to appear on stage, they, uh, uh, you don't even have to pay them. Uh, you, just, uh, you just offer them an audience and some sycophants, and, and they'll cross the world for it, <laughs> literally. <laughs> Vain, sad creatures that we are. Um, and uh, so it's quite, if you can get a little bit of sponsorship, it's not a difficult thing to do, and people will turn up. And what was exciting for publishing in Britain in the 1990s was that when all the other indicators were in, were in, in Dakai, everyone was worried about the internet taking over people's time, sales were going down, less and less space being given in newspapers for serious literature. Suddenly you were getting these huge crowds, not just at Hay, but also at Cheltenham and at Edinburgh. Um, and quite regularly you get, I mean, Edinburgh I think is the biggest festival in the world in terms of number of authors. Uh, it has 260 authors every year. Um, slightly smaller than us in terms of footfall, but uh, you, were, you were regularly getting five, ten, even a hundred thousand people turning up at these things. And I'd done a year's book tour for White Moogles in 2002 to three, and came back to Delhi um, and realized that there was nothing like this happening here. There were occasions like the Nimrana Festival organized by Namita Gokhali, uh, where you had writers discussing things with writers, but the public weren't let in. Um, it was a kind of you know, literary moot um, where they all sort of you know, got at each other. Naipaul shouted at the American ambassador's wife. And, and uh, there were huge... Uh, Amitav Ghosh had a go at uh, Roberto Colasso. And, and it, was, it, was kind of, you know, it was kind of literary cockfight, really. Um, and so when Faith Singh, who's had a small festival in Jaipur that did dance and music and fashion... Uh, but not uh, books. She invited, I was staying with her, and she invited me to give a reading. Um, that was the first reading at Diggy Palace, and 14 people turned up, which is what you, I think the story you were referring to, um, of whom 10 were Japanese tourists who were looking for Amer Palace, and they got lost. <laughs> and in fact, there were, I think there were literally four people in the room who'd actually intended to hear the reading. One of them was my wife, <laughs> and the other was Faith. So, uh, <laughs> so it was an inauspicious beginning. Uh, but the next year, I, see, I just saw Shoba... Uh, passing uh, down the back uh, in her wonderful kit over there. Shoba Day and uh, Tarun uh, Tejpal and about 10 others turned up uh, at a festival which Pramod KG um, put together. I brought in, um, I've always, my job has always been the Farangis uh, and still is. I don't do the Desi programming in, in Jaipur, I just do the Farangis. I brought in Harry Kunzru and, uh, and that had about four or 5,000 people. It was a very big leap from the first year. And from that point, it kept doubling. 2007, we had Salman Rushdie, Suketu Mehta, um, and uh, Kiran Desai. She'd won the Booker that year. That got on the front page of every newspaper. And that year, about 25,000 people turned up. And the next year, it was 50, went up to 100. And last year, we just crossed 250,000. And there are now, I believe, 64 literary festivals in South Asia, eight years later. So a million flowers did bloom. Not quite a million, thank God, but a quarter of a million is fighting for us. <laughs> <laughs> but then one question that's intrigued me always was, uh, you know, uh, most all the organizers of the Jaipur Literature Festival are based out of Delhi. Uh, and at least in the first few years, now, of course, everyone makes their 
annual Kumbh Mela pilgrimage to Jaipur in January. Uh, but in the early years, all the uh, attendees too were largely Delhi audiences who would probably drive down to uh, Jaipur for a nice weekend on the Republic Day uh, holiday around that time. So why why Jaipur? And you know, uh, it could have been a Delhi literature festival, DLF. Yeah. Perhaps not the Robert Wadra <laughs> connection, I'm ho I hope. <laughs> so, to answer that, first of all, it did very much grow out of Faith Singh's Virasat Festival. Um, Faith and John Singh, amazing couple, who, uh, she's a bishop's daughter from England. He was a, a Rajput prince who ran India's first psychedelic disco in the 1960s in the basement of the Rambag, which was called the Fertilized Egg. <laughs> <laughs> And this couple started Anoki, and then when they handed Anoki over to their children, uh, they um, began a uh, program of bringing in all the kind of village arts of Rajasthan, particularly the music. And John Singh would go out to very remote village festivals right out in the, in the desert and bring in the last guy who played some strange sort of, uh, some particular sort of ney or flute, um, or some, some strange rural sarangi, which you know, had... had no frets or, or a longer neck or whatever it was that made it different. Um, and he would showcase them at Jaipur. Uh, and I say literature was only one part of, of that. But that, in the end, they, there was various problems with the funding and, of that. And that, in the end, morphed into the, Jab the Jodhpur Riff and moved off to the next town, to Jodhpur. So we ended up with two festivals, a, a literature one in, in Jaipur, and where, where it all began, and, and the, the music in, uh, in Jodhpur. But uh, in, the, in the same way that Hay is a tiny town that is off the beaten track, but is a lovely place to go to for a weekend, and was half the attraction and the success of the, of the Hay Festival, what people have discovered is that it's often not the metropolitan centers that are the biggest successes. The, there are festivals in London, but London has so much that goes on anyway that no one notices them. It's not a big event. Uh, there's too much other noise in the background. Uh, and the say, I mean, the, the only big, really big urban festival that's totally taken off in Britain is the Edinburgh Literature Festival, which coincides with the Edinburgh Festival, when you have a million visitors in coming to hear music and other stuff. Um, and it works at Jaipur, I think, because um, Jaipur is easily accessible from both Bombay and Delhi. There are direct flights. It's a place people like to hang out. Uh, it, there's all sorts of other things you can go and do while you're in Jaipur. Uh, it's the right time of year. It's gorgeous weather. Uh, it's, it, it's chilly at night. And um, it has whatever it has, you know, 2,000 hotels. So you can, you can, you, you can fill up. Um, and if you book in advance, it, 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 it's, there's always somewhere to stay. And, and so I think it's interesting. I mean, there was, there was a lot of discussion in the British press about why Hay was so much bigger than London. It didn't make any sense. London you know, has five million people. It's, it's a huge center. It should be the big place for literature festivals. But it, the weird thing was that Hay was bigger and more successful because people just wanted to go there for a weekend. And there was this, this strange thing which is at literary festivals where it is both educational and cultural, but it's also a sense of holiday. People are here, you lot, you know, you're, not, you're not working today, you've got your day off. Um, and um, and it's, an, it's quite a fun place to hang out, a, a literary festival. And if you're somewhere you really want to be, people will go. We did detailed, for the last three years, we've had very detailed um, statistics of where people are coming from. And our statistics are one-third Delhi, one-third Jaipur or immediate Rajasthan hinterland, uh, and one-third Bombay and the rest of India. Um, I'll now move to Kolkata and Chennai, uh, and probably uh, Anjum first. And so, both, in fact, both the cities, Kolkata and Chennai, unlike Jaipur, which I don't think is such a great reading city by itself, both Calcutta and Madras have been traditionally centers of intellectuals, of writers, uh, and there have been so many uh, events already happening. And I do recall that the Oxford bookstore is perhaps 100 years old, and there's so much Close of... To, yeah. yeah, and Kolkata is known for thinkers and intellectuals. Yeah. And the... And Chennai has its own different other fora, like the Madras Book Club, which uh, probably draws in lots and lots of audiences. So where was the need for another literature festival? Or did you face that as a challenge, uh, where people said another literary conclave was actually redundant? Should I go first? Yeah, you could yeah. take it first. Okay, in fact, listening to William, I was thinking of the 
how we faced it. I'm associated with the APJ Kolkata Literary Festival, which grew out of a bookstore, Oxford bookstore. And I was thinking of how we have almost exactly opposite challenges. Because here you have a festival that's being planned by a group of people who um, have book events regularly, one or two a week throughout the year. The most, the sort of the biggest best-selling authors or the biggest uh, award-winning authors, the serious literatures, the historians, the scholars, they've all been to the bookstore and they've all had very interesting, intimate, in-depth events and book launches. So exactly what uh, Vikram's question was, that uh, what is the need for a literary festival? And if we are going to have a literary festival, how do we make it different from the regular ongoing events that happen at not just Oxford, but at other bookstores in the city. Along with that is the whole um, question of how Kolkata is a city that's been absolutely immersed in literature and the arts and culture. Has a, the perception is that it has this amazing audience who are so well read and so sort of well versed in the various arts that you know, they are really almost like a challenge to anybody who's a writer or an artist who wants to present in front of them. So there's this whole sort of received history of this amazing, culturally rich, soaked city. So what do you offer Kolkata that is going to make it stand up and take notice at all? And, um, and at the same time, uh, those of you who visited Kolkata may uh, remember it as a city that doesn't have these amazing wide open spaces where you can kind of escape. It is a congested city, even physically in terms of atmosphere and ambience. It's very interesting, but it's, it's a city that uh, is full of, you know, it's a crowded, overcrowded city. So it's not as if one can easily find a space where everybody can escape and have a pleasant getaway over two, three days. So these are some of the challenges that we were dealing with and grappling with when coming up with the idea of a literary festival. Now, very simply, although Calcutta had had and continues to have a wide range of literary activities in Bengali and in Hindi and in English, it has the biggest book fair in Asia. And the Kolkata Boi Mala, which is held every January, has million footfalls and it's a readers um, and buyers fair as opposed to a trade fair. In spite of that, Calcutta did not have a literary festival, qua literary festival, till APJ Kolkata started and we're now going to be five years old in January, so four and a half years ago. This was the first festival uh, along the lines of what had come to be seen almost as a, as a genre you know, the literary festival where you gather together writers and thinkers and you put them into situations where they engage with each other, they engage with an audience, they be, are able to interact, people have that thrill of being able to, you know, sort of uh, engage with them on an ongoing basis over two, three days. So that was really uh, the very first time Calcutta had uh, a literary festival. I don't know if I've answered your yeah, question. I you, yeah, it's you time to me to yeah. shut up, basically. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, okay. Thank you very much, uh, Anjum, because a lot of pointers in what she said. Chennai does have its literary crowd, its music passionate crowd, its cultural crowd. And as you know, every year in December, the whole city is out at all these music sabhas. And we have friends from Chennai who, have, uh, who are right here in the audience who can attest to that. And we have uh, people, uh, we do, but we didn't have that kind of uh, the book fair crowd or the book in fact, we don't even have a proper bookshop in Chennai. I'm sorry to say that, though. Some bookshops, some places call themselves bookshops. And neither did we have William's experience of um, having a large, exotic city, uh, which can be uh, a magnet to draw in people who um, want to come there and spend two, three days on a weekend. But we did, what we do have is a newspaper, which I, in my view, we had this excellent platform because we had 20 years of the literary review and which we kind of struggle to push regardless of pressures from our marketing department saying, you're not bringing a single ad in, we're going to shut you down next month. And uh, we persisted. And when it was 20 years old, we decided that we should have something to commemorate that. We did have the grand example of uh, Jaipur by then, and I think it was working on all our minds that 
we should become a forum where we could draw readers and writers together. But uh, the main idea at that point in 2010, or to late 2009, was to celebrate 20 years of the Hindu Literary Review and its struggle. And this is probably because we were the only newspaper that had the uh, luxury of showcasing authors regularly, including people like Rushdie, uh, all through the storm and the controversies. And we just uh, kind of managed to get away with uh, nobody um, hammering at our gates, except at one point uh, when we have, this, we have this publication called Young World, where there was some kind of a thing that offended a group of uh, people, and we had people at our gates who kind of threatened to burn the building. I, we'd like to hear more from William about uh, last year's controversy. Oh, yes, that's Hopefully coming up. That's talk, coming up. That's coming talk up. about <laughs> it. But we figured that... I think he's asking the easy questions first. <laughs> <laughs> but as of now, we decided that this is an excellent platform through which we can showcase readers and writers. And um, I remember reading in a book how, um, you know, um, books have a kind of a homing instinct in finding their perfect readers. And we sort of felt as a literature festival... Uh, evolves from that kind of feeling where you bring uh, the perfect reader to the writer and vice versa, the author goes to the reader. So we found that the last couple of years we've had some pretty, uh, you know, sort of a good crowd, not a great crowd, not the same crowd that goes to the Sabahs because unfortunately, as I said, this is not a city that, you know, rushes to lit fest. But at the same time, we have a very discerning group of readers and writers who want to come. And we haven't had 14 or 41. We might have had 400 people last year, but... We are still growing, and we look forward to um, a kind of a festival that I admire Vikram for what he's doing now, and I think Bangalore is a great venue. We are like Calcutta somewhat. We don't have posh venues. We have uh, hotels. We don't have exotic locations like William does. But we've managed to uh, find a very excellent school that's been very hospitable to us, and uh, we look forward to another festival early in January. And Bangalore is very close by, so we invite you all to come over to Madras during the Pongal holidays, <laughs> and we'll give you a real treat. <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> I mean, uh, now, we'll, uh, since we've discussed about uh, you know, all the literature festivals, I thought we'll uh, handle what it means to different components of a lit fest. And probably the most important component of a literature festival is the participant uh, authors. So uh, I, I uh, remember reading some, somewhere that Amitav Ghosh had said something to the effect that Literature is only for private and personal reading, and it's not a spectacle. Uh, William, what would be your take on that? So let me first say I'm a huge admirer of Amitav's writing. I think he's a great writer, and um, I particularly admire um, In an Antique Land, which I think is one of the most interesting works of nonfiction to come out of India in the last 20 years. Um, let me say second that I think you know ev everyone's um, totally... Uh, uh, allowed to have their own opinion on this. Uh, if, if some people don't like LitFest, that's absolutely fine. Um, and um, you don't have to come. Stay at home. Read books. <laughs> Which is, you know, great. That's, no one's complaining about that. But I think it was an extremely disingenuous answer by Amitav, who goes to a huge amount of literary festivals. I, I've seen him at several myself. Uh, and um, uh, the... Uh, uh, his reasons for coming for Jaipur are, are quite other than uh, than the ones stated, um, which I probably am not. I probably not at, not at uh, not at uh, liberty to um, um, uh, to disclose. But shall we say that there was a, one of those occasions when um, uh, you know with blackberries you have the reply all option, uh, <laughs> and a comment a comment made by one of the team about. Uh, um, uh, the, uh, a certain bit of a certain self-importance uh, in one of his replies went straight back to him, um, which is the true uh, uh, answer to why he didn't come. Uh, but I think it's that he raised actually a very interesting point because um, there is a there is a body of opinion, and it's a perfectly legitimate opinion out there that literary festivals are are like sort of slightly elevated cocktail parties. Uh, where people come, um, meet each other, kiss each other, go wah wah, then head off to the coffee shop somewhere and, uh, and never, uh, and never engage with literature at all. And certainly, I mean, of, you know, in the 250,000 people that turned up at Jaipur last year, I'm sure there were, um, you know, a certain number of thousands of people who 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 did mainly hang out in the coffee shops and went to the parties and and didn't engage with it. Um, but there is absolutely no question that our sessions are packed full not just the sessions from 
Uh, anyone that's ever been to Jaipur will know this, it's standing room only. Uh, in a sense, this is one of our biggest problems, is that we, you know, it, every inch of space up to the stage is just chock-a-block. Uh, and it's not just the obvious you know, um, Bikram sets and, uh, uh, or Gulzars pulling in the, the crowds. Even uh, Namata, my co-director, Namata Gokhali, one year um, in, uh, made Dalit literature her theme. And I thought it went slightly over the top in, in asking 35 Dalit poets. I thought, you know, 5, 10, fine, maybe 15. But why do you need 35? That's slightly overdoing it. Uh, and um, I think if you are brave in your programming and... and are serious in your programming and, and find new things that people want to hear about, uh, it doesn't matter at all if they're not celebrity names. Um, it, uh, people will respond to the seriousness of the occasion and, um, and, and engage and, 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 and take it on. Um, but I think there's something else. I mean, I think it's very important to take in that while Amitav is completely right that the primary act of literature is the author engaging with his piece of paper or his blank screen alone in his room. And at another point, the reader sitting down on their couch on their own, concentrating and entering that world. And it is a, a, a union of, of, of an individual with, a, with, with, with another mind. And that is the primary act of literature. But it's also true that from in all societies uh, and at all points in history, there has always been uh, the performance of literature uh, in English our greatest writer ever, Shakespeare, um, you know, wrote literature that was meant for public performance, that needed an audience. Uh, the Globe Theatre was a business. And if it didn't pull in the punters, it would have closed down and Shakespeare wouldn't have written another play. And um, India in particular, I think this is the super important point yeah. to, uh, to emphasize, has one of the richest traditions of performed public literature in any society in the world. And this dates from the Sangam period uh, in the south through to the Mughal Mushairas in, in the north. Uh, and uh, the center of cultural life in Delhi uh, in the 18th and 19th century was the Mushaira. And um, for those of you who aren't familiar with, with what happened, uh, sometime in the morning, a tal would be set uh, and all the poets who were going to engage would be given the rhyme schemes that they had to engage with. And then it was like a sort of it, it's half, half poetry, half parlor game. A, a circle of poets would be sitting around a room uh, with candles and, and incense, uh, and they would throw couplets at each other. And you had to reply instantly in the same, in the same uh, verse form with a reply. Um, so Ghalib would, would throw something at Zork, and he would raise a sharp, send it back again. And it had to, make, you know, it had to be a, a, a response. It, had to be a, 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 it couldn't just be a, a rhyme you'd made up earlier. Although I think there was a fair amount of that. People prepared uh, uh, with a view to humiliating their, uh, their, their opponents. And I'd just like to, before handing on to everyone else, um, read from a keynote speech that um, Sheldon Pollock, the great Sanskritist, um, gave at Jaipur three years ago when he was talking about how uh, ancient the tradition of the literary festival is in India. I mean, you started today by talking about Jaipur beginning seven years ago or eight years ago. Um, but in reality, there are literary festivals, and many of these were in what's now Karnataka. This is Sheldon Pollock uh, talking from the stage at Jaipur. I came to realize that the literary festival, that, like the Jaipur Literary Festival today, is really a very old institution in India. Imagine ourselves back in time, seven or so centuries ago, a town called Kalyana in what is today northern Karnataka. People were not, of course, flown in from around the world, but they clearly came from around India. Kalyana attracted some of the best and certainly a most diverse assemblage of poets. Poets presented songs and literary texts in Sanskrit, Prakrit, and Apabramsha, the great cosmopolitan languages of India. I mean a language unconstrained by place, a sort of trans-regional language used all over the subcontinent, to whose number of, uh, eventually Persian and English will be added, but also Kannada and Gujarati, Avadi, Eastern Hindi, Bangla and Oriya. It is hard to tell which. Madhya Deshiya, the ancestor of Brajbasha in classical Hindi, uh, Magadhi, Bihari, Marathi. Some poets used more than one language for their composition, and Sukhasarika, the parrot minor, a question-answer song, was presented half in Canada and half in Gujarati. Vichitra, the Harlequin composition, was a polyglot genre described as the ten avatars of Vishnu. And in the version presented at our Kalyana Literary Festival, 
started with Canada and Marathi, proceed through Madhya, proceeded through Madhya Deshya to Bangla and Sanskrit. An important aspect of the literary festival of Kalyana is that it wasn't peculiar to North Karnataka in the 12th century, but was the rule throughout Indian history. Indeed, closer to our time here in Jaipur itself, the court of Sawai Jai Singh in the first half of the 18th century had a fabulous goshti, or literary festival, every day, with writers presenting compositions in Sanskrit, Brajpasha, and two literary idioms of Rajasthani Dingle, one for martial compositions and Pingal for more courtly, but also Persian. Raja Ayamal, Jai Singh's Pradhan, or chief minister, was a renowned poet in Persian. This kind of literary diversity has long been the hallmark of Indian literary cultures for more than two millennia. India represents the longest, continuous, multilingual literary tradition in the world, and its contributions are among the most luminous ever made to world literary culture. Wow. wow. That was truly illuminating, I think, for everybody. Yeah, but I come back to the contemporary times and a slightly more philosophical question about are these really necessary for a writer? Uh, because, you know, till now writers have always lived in anonymity. Their books have been more important. Now the writer, and of course with all the PR and the marketing and all that that goes along, the, the, the writer becomes larger than his work. And in such a case, uh, and most often a writer is supposed to become a stage performer. You have parallel sessions. So in the very first few minutes, if you do not catch the attention of the audience and with your wit and whatever, you're going to lose them. They're going to dwindle away to another parallel session. So the constant pressure of performance is very much there on the writer. So uh, Nirmala, what, what do you think? Uh, um, I, interestingly, I don't quite agree that the writer has to be a performer. Uh, because I believe that the words that he writes, the publication speaks for itself. And you have the whole paraphernalia of marketing and, you know, whatever uh, that follows that. Uh, we found from our own uh, experience in the last uh, two festivals particularly, though there were, uh, there were two or three writers who did not crave that kind of audience, neither did they perform for that kind of audience. And yet we had a steadfast crowd that stayed throughout. And it could have been, um, you know, some uh, obscure session that had, I mean, I mean, I forget the topics, but I do remember that we had, um, you know, even if it's uh, something that we even had young people staying on, and if it was the 20 people instead of the 200, they were still very absorbed. And they did not require the, for the writer to be a star or a performer. And I don't know if it's to do peculiarly to do with Chennai or it's, uh, you know, it's intent to learn more and absorb more. I wouldn't want to categorize any city in India like that. But I do think that we do have a, a system of community sharing of words, of ideas, of thoughts, of exchanges, and much like the wonderful things that uh, William read. I think it's a long tradition in India. And by taking up these kind of, uh, may, uh, these projects, I think we just kind of act as catalyzers to, um, you know, be more inclusive in bringing people to their uh, readers and ri readers to their writers. What I found most exciting was not so much the way the, uh, the writer performed, but after the session, how the writer uh, mingled with the audience, with the readers, and the sheer delight of that, I think, uh, was memorable for every, um, every person who attended the festival. And that, I think that was a big takeaway for a lot of people. And I think that's why festivals should go on the way they do. Can I just add to, of course, um, I totally agree with, uh, with what you said, that it isn't always necessary for, an, for a writer to perform. In fact, I think writers who are performative, as a, if I may say so, William, who I think is, is a brilliant performer, when he stands up there and he starts talking, you know, you, he really engages you. And we've had other uh, uh, writers who are equally good on stage and can hold uh, the audience's attention. On the other hand, you have writers who engage in, uh, in discussion in a different kind of way, where they're not necessary perfor necessarily performing, but they are engaging with the subject under discussion, or they're talking about what they're comfortable and what they know. And I think a lot of that has to do with the curation. I think there has to be a sense of balance when you're, when you're planning a festival, so that you have scope for both kinds of events, the more performative ones and the quieter, more introspective ones and maybe create spaces which allow both to happen. So. OK, we'll now move perhaps to the audiences. And we did bring that up about, uh, you know, a lot of them do come. They want to soak into the whole atmosphere. It's a carnival kind of a, a place. It's not an academic, uh, boring discussion. 
Uh, but then how many would probably, th do liter literature festivals actually beget a, a reading culture? Uh, do you think it would actually result in many in the audience actually reading more, someone actually getting inspired to write perhaps? And does it translate into book sales increasing at the bookstore? Well, I, mean, I have the figures from Jaipur last year. We sold 1.2 million books, um, and which is one of our main sources of income. We get a cut from the bookshop. Um, and uh, that's how we pay for the thing. <laughs> uh, so 1.2 million books is not a bad sale uh, by any standards anywhere in the world. It's, I mean, it's equivalent of, of you know, a, a, a several Delhi bookshops' annual sales put together. Yeah. Uh, and there's no question that our signing queues for our big stars, when you have one of the real big, when you know, we brought in Kurt Seer. Kurt Seer is only spoken in public about three times, uh, uh, Nobel Prize winner, the only guy to win the Booker twice, and uh, we had a four-hour signing queue. And that was, one, that was one of the most interesting sessions we ever had, because he, he, made it, he said he'd, he'd... I'd been to a festival he um, helps uh, organize in Adelaide. And some, I can't remember what it was. Something went wrong. And he wrote a letter of apology uh, for what had happened. And I ju jumped on the chance and, and said, sir, you wouldn't... Uh, uh, as, as compensation. <laughs> And he said, yes, and I will, uh, but I will, I have uh, very clear what I will do. I will do one reading for 45 minutes. There will be no questions. Uh, and I will do one congenial panel to be arranged. Uh, and that was his stipulation, and he stuck to that exactly. And so I thought, I, I wasn't quite sure how uh, an, an Indian audience would respond to a 45-minute reading. We'd never had one before. Uh, we do panel, we do short readings, but uh, uh, an entire session made up with one man standing at a lectern. But Kurt Zier has this sort of strangely terrifying charisma. And he just stood up, and it's like a headmaster or a particularly chilly sort of, uh, a sort of commandant or something. And we had the biggest stage in Jaipur packed to the gunnels, so the people were on the roof watching. And he had them completely transfixed for 45 minutes. Not one mobile phone went off. No one moved. Uh, and he read for 45 minutes. And there was a standing ovation, which went on for about 10 minutes. And there was a four-hour signing queue. So I, again, you know, you can, you, you, people are, I, are very serious. And I think, I think a lot of the criticism that you read about literary festivals, particularly Jaipur, um, comes from people that haven't actually been to the festival, but are receiving it through the media. Uh, because we, uh, one of the things that happens with, with Jaipur, not, because, not through any fault of our own, is that you know, the Times of India turns up and does its page three page from it. So you have Feroz Gudral wearing something lovely by you know, I don't know, Tarant Hiliani in the front page. And it looks as if it's just a fashion show. If you were to be sitting in Delhi or sitting in, uh, in Agra reading the paper, you think that it's some sort of fashion meet. Um, and then there's always the gossip columns about who's fallen out with who. Or, um, and, and then there's sometimes when uh, you said we're coming to the whole Rushdie thing, when an entire festival uh, of, of 200 authors, 250 authors, um, gets taken over in the media by a single event. Uh, Rushdie last year, uh, and oh, that, there, was two st there were two stories that year which the media reported. One was Rushdie coming, not coming, and the other was Oprah coming. Uh, now, Oprah invited herself. We didn't invite Oprah. Uh, and obviously, if Oprah writes to you and says, can I come to your festival, you say yes. You don't, you don't, <laughs> you don't say no. But uh, it wasn't, you know, she, we hadn't sort of gone out to sort of you know, dumb down and, and produce some sort of Hollywood celeb. It was, she wanted to come and we have given her a platform, one session. Um, and it was infuriating because at the same time as, as these two non-events in a sense, because Rushdie didn't come um, and it was a very painful business, but, and we can talk about that happily later. Um, uh, Oprah, and Oprah did come, but it wasn't like it was, you know, the be all and end of the festival. We had at the same time Tom Stoppard and David Hare, not one festival, you know, reported that. We had Richard Dawkins, Stephen Pinker, two other Nobel Prize winners, and, and, and no one was writing about it. No one was writing about, about bloody opera. <laughs> and I had, and I, to be honest, I don't watch much television, and I hadn't quite realized what, the, what, who Oprah was. I mean, it's a vaguely familiar name, and I, and I, I thought, okay, fine. <laughs> and I thought, but, but no one will know her in India. So, <laughs> so he said, yeah, you have one little session, that's fine, come along. We won't pay your flight. <laughs> um, and I had, I had in no way expected what happened, which was cues from the previous night to try and get into the power of television. Yeah. Anjum, what would be your thoughts on this whole, you know, uh, what does it do for the audiences? You know, um, ever since I can remember, uh, well, for the last uh, seven or eight years, all I've heard is people bemoaning the death of reading. 
oh, young readers don't want to read, everybody's gone onto the internet, what's going to happen to writers? Well, I think that uh, a festival, a literary festival, which makes a big deal, gives us space of respect to the word, to the published word and to writing, allows you to uh, actually come and hear authors talking intelligently, most of them do, and, uh, you know, about their work, making it interesting, taking it beyond the page. I think that that can only be a positive thing. And I think it does create an interest in books that uh, may be in danger of waning, though statistics also show that reading seems to be safe and sound, at least in India, and at least for the next so many years. But I think that it can, it is a positive thing. I think that uh, publishers certainly support book festivals, which can only show that they feel that they're worth it. Publishers, on the other hand, don't necessarily support book launches in different cities. They don't uh, happily support them because they don't see many, much sale coming out of a book launch, but they do support festivals. And that is a, a, a proof that things sell, like you said, 1.2, uh, whatever, uh, you know, so many books. So I think it's a positive. Um, I agree with a lot of what Anjum said, but we haven't really, in the Hindu, found any publisher that really came forward to support us. But I'd like they to don't. thank Vikram for a very good uh, pointer about book sales and mm. bookshops being the largest source of um, revenue for JLF. Uh, what happened in Chennai last year was that we had a very, uh, we had a strong book part, I don't want to name names, but, and they made a huge ton of money, but we never saw any of it, just simply because our marketing people hadn't had the sense to, you know, negotiate and uh, uh, make a deal up, uh, with them. So what is happening for us is a learning experience. For instance, last year we found... Okay, thank you for that as well, William. <laughs> I'll go back with greater resolve now. Uh, the thing is that we found last year that we had a very, um, uh, you know, an inspired crowd of uh, people who would read anyway, who want to meet authors and writers, but we were lacking in the younger crowd. And uh, like um, Anjum says, I do believe that uh, the young people are not people who are not reading. I think reading has come back and they are not just stuck on Twitter and they do go to the Twitter link and see what the expansion is and read that stuff and so on. So this year we decided to have um, activities well before the literature festival, outreach programs that would take our volunteers to take our uh, consultants and uh, program people into colleges. And um, even now, um, by the way, the Hindu literary uh, prize for best fiction is also tied in with our literary festival. And uh, we'll announce our shortlist sometime in November. And even before the shortlist is out, we found a group of colleges in the city saying that we'd like to dramatize the shortlist once it's out. Will you give us a prize? And we are happy to give them a prize. So um, these are the kind of things that draw young people in. And I believe, uh, Vikram, that I think that there is an ongoing uh, range of uh, uh, interests from, you know, from a variety of uh, uh, people in, in, in the cities who want to learn more, want to do more, and want to engage more with um, reading and ideas. William, I'll probably uh, have this question for you that, you know, while literature festivals in India uh, take a lot of pride in inviting a lot of foreign authors, uh, has the reverse ever been the case? Uh, except the token Vikram Seth and, you know, uh, Arundhati Roy's and Salman Rushdie's, do the Sahitya Academy winners, the Gyanpeet winners from India, why, because of all this cross-cultural osmosis that Litfest, like Jaipur, like Chennai, Kolkata have facilitated, why doesn't it result in a lot of Indian authors being featured abroad or recognized abroad? So two, two questions and two answers there. Um, the direct inspiration for starting Jaipur, I remember how, the moment the idea came, uh, was sitting at Hey On Why, seeing uh, all these Indian authors on stage uh, and realizing that in fact there was nowhere in Delhi um, or uh, in Northern India where they, were, where they were appearing. Occasionally, you know, someone would be brought in by the British Council and would speak to 200 people. But it was a sensation that, in fact, it was easier to see Indian authors in Hay on Wai or Cheltenham or Edinburgh or Sydney or Penn, New York, wherever it was, than it actually was in, in the 1990s to see them in India. There was a sensation whereby India was being mediated to the West by a group of Indian writers in English um, who were doing very well, were winning prizes, were very prominent. Um, but that most of them actually lived in the West. So you had a whole lot of people sitting in Brooklyn, New York, and Wiltshire writing about India from their childhood. Uh, presented for, for white readership abroad. 
uh, but, uh, and that it was, but it never actually coming back to India, and, and in a sense giving back what they, um, uh, what what they were writing to India. So that was directly the inspiration for doing it. Originally, the idea was to bring Indian authors back to India. As for um, Basha and vernacular writing in Western literary festivals, no. In uh, in all honesty, I I think. Um, the West isn't simply is largely unaware that that literature exists. Not not just uh, Bhasha. I mean, even in Indians writing in English. There's a huge amount of Indians writing in English featured in literary festivals. Uh, in fact, there are, it's so much so prominent in Indian writers in Britain that occasionally you find jokes on talk shows about uh, can you believe it a white man's won the Booker Prize or something. You know, the, the, it's a <laughs> this is a rare occasion. <laughs> <laughs> I actually remember one particular joke on, I can't remember which comedians, uh, talking about how he'd bumped into an Indian in the street. It was the only, it was the only Indian in Britain who hadn't won the Booker Prize. <laughs> uh, and um, so, no, I think there's a huge and very, and, and that obviously publishers, like any other marketing people, um, always try to commission what did well last year, in a sense. If, you know, so, so, the, the success of Rushdie, Vikram Set, and Arundhati Roy and Kiran Desai meant that agents were coming to India, scooping up talent, which is not always necessarily a good thing. I mean, in the immediate aftermath of Arundhati Roy, uh, when she was sitting on the bestseller list for six months and selling over a million copies of The God of Small Things, there were three or four literary agents who came and signed up randomly, sort of almost anyone who had a novel in their bottom drawer. And there were some real shockers that came out the following year, <laughs> which, which, which produced a reaction in the opposite direction. I won't name any names, but... Uh. Well, uh, when we started off last year, we had this uh, newspapers which said, like a young debutant in the midst of a congregation of greying beauty queens, <laughs> the Bangalore Literature Festival has to appease to both its enthusiastic audience and those bemoaning the tamasha fixation. And I think a lot of that Tamasha fixation comes from uh, the whole controversy aspect of literature festivals. And I think uh, you're most well suited to answer that hand, hand held on the heart and with all sincerity. Please do tell us uh, how many of these controversies are actually organic and how many of those are planted. <laughs> I can say with my hand on my heart, although I haven't got my hand on my heart, because I've got a, a microphone in one hand and a cup of coffee in the other. But, but if I had my hand on my heart, I would say that not one of them uh, is, is generated, and they are uh, a real irritation. Um, and um, we spend, you know, nine months a year pulling together the best program we can. Um, the, we have this continual problem that the media does not reflect the festival as it is. Um, we... The, the breakup with Jaipur is very simple. It's, it's one third Farangi, which is my corner of it. Uh, it's two thirds Desi. And of the two thirds that, that, that is Desi, half is not in English. So we have a huge number of sessions uh, in Hindi, in Rajasthani, uh, uh, and other languages, which Namata brilliantly programs. I mean, how do you present Tamil literature to a, to a largely Hindi speaking audience? These are you know, important questions you have to wrestle with Malayali, uh, whatever it is, or Bengali. Um, and uh, Namata succeeds each year in pulling in capacity crowds for authors who are not celebrities on, uh, uh, in, the, in the English language media. Uh, and, it's, and that, in a sense, is the biggest, uh, biggest success of Jaipur, that, that we have uh, each year 100 authors not in English uh, who are given a huge platform. But it is never presented in the media at all. And there is a widespread impression out there that Jaipur is only about cocktail party writers and... Um, uh, and uh, entirely English. And it is, the opposite is true. And, and, and the, just seeing, you know, 5,000 people fitting in for a, a session on sort of, you know, Punjabi Dalit poetry, for example, is, is one of the most extraordinary things. And, it's, and it works, I think, largely because the audience we get, even if they don't read this stuff, feel that they should know more about it. And so you have a, a, a whole middle-class Indian audience turning up who don't read a lot of Hindi literature who, um, and who feel some sort of nagging sense of guilt that they should know more about this. Uh, and, and they certainly don't read, you know, Mawari poetry or, uh, or, or Tamil poetry if they're coming from Delhi. But they're interested to discover about it. And so a lot of people will, will sit in and listen and, 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 and sort of um, browse. Uh, and, and that, I think, is, is, is very exciting. But a big, a big controversy like, um, uh, like the Rushdie one... Um, well, there's two different things to say, first of all. Last year, we had this, this controversy with... Um, uh, with Ashish Nandi. Uh, and 
that, in a sense, was manufactured by the media. There was actually a, a, a column written on night three of the... Um, the we, have, we stopped the accreditation at Jaipur at 750 journalists. And there was a whole um, discussion on one blog post about how there was no controversy at Jaipur this year, nothing to report. And they were having to write about Dalit poetry. Uh, and, um, and this was uh, the following day that the Ashish Nandi came in. And, it, and it, uh, anyone that watches the clip will see he said something quite different to what the media reported him saying. You know, um, it was a, it was a, 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 a total confection. Uh, and he was made to be sounding anti-Dalit when he was actually being anti or uh, he, was, he, was a, he was saying that the corruption lies in the upper caste. Um, but uh, that was all that was reported for the next two days of the festival. And we actually had the police around and all this sort of nonsense. Mm. And then the worst example was obviously the, um, the Salman Rushdie non-appearance. Yep. Yep. Just to give that story, because it's not well known what actually happened. Um, Salman was a hugely important figure for us. He came to Jaipur in 2007 when we were about this size um, and um, instantly added, doubled, the, the, the quadrupled the, the focus on the festival and the media. He was kind, avuncular, and, but we didn't announce him in advance and he was happy with that. This time he said, he suddenly got a phone call 20 days before curtains up saying, why is my name not on the list? And I said, well, we didn't put it on last time, we don't think it's wise. And he insisted, and I stupidly said, we'll do it. And that was entirely my fault. Uh, I should have been much firmer and said, this is nuts. Clearly, that's not, it's election year. There's all sorts of good reasons why we should have you. But he said, I'm not going to be like a rabbit. The word he used on the phone is, I'm not going to be like a, a white rabbit popping out of a hat each time. Uh, either you put me up or I'm not coming. Which, I, you know, you can understand where he's coming from, but I, but it, it, I, should, have be, I should have had more sense than to have agreed that. And within three days, it was in the media, and within four days, we had a fatwa from Deoband. And then all this nonsense started, which we, to this day, really have no idea whether it's true or not. This, the CID said there were assassins coming from Bombay. Um, they actually named three names. Someone checked it out, and it turned out these guys were in jail or didn't exist anyway. Uh, and and it's, it's, this is the trouble with intelligence agencies, like with the whole run-up to the Iraq war. People, you know, intelligence agencies claim to know more than you do. They claim to have information. You have no idea whether they're making it up. Um, but it was extremely unfortunate. Then the final moment, in the final day, we'd agreed to um, have a video cast, and someone himself tweeted about it, and it got out in the, in the media, and this was meant to be the kind of surprise at the end. He's going to sit in London. Barker Dutt was going to interview him. And um, we, had, we, we had this crowd of, uh, of, of uh, various political, Muslim political groups marching on the, on the venue, uh, and we had about 300 in the venue, and the police said there were 2,000 outside waiting to march in. And we had this desperate decision. Do you go ahead with a session that will almost certainly provoke violence in an overcrowded venue where there are women and children, uh, where there's one exit, uh, in a state where the state police had fired on Muslim demonstrators three weeks earlier in Bharatpur and killed 100? Um, or do you pull the session and negate the free speech that um, the Literary Festival is all about. One of the hardest 20 minutes of, uh, of decision-making, possibly the hardest decision I've ever had to take, I think. And it was, we all sat, and, and the three of us that run the festival, Sandro Roy, Namata, and I, we had the, the man from the, who owns the Diggy Palace, uh, we had the, the police. And in the end, um, the owner of Diggy took the decision as the festival host, who, had, who, would, who would be locked up if there was any violence that he was going to ban the session. But he then, however, managed to get the interview taking place, as someone was ready and sitting in a studio in London, um, from a hotel room in Diggy, which was then broadcast to five million people internationally that night. So he wasn't silenced, but the only place you couldn't see it was Diggy Grounds. Which was, so it was an uncomfortable compromise, but I feel we kind of, we avoided, I mean, had there been deaths hmm. or a crush like there had been in the festival in Jodhpur uh, the previous year where 30 people had been killed. Had we had deaths or injuries, the festival would be closed down, which wouldn't have been a victory for lit right. literature either. Um, and Rushdie got to be heard by a far larger audience. It was the front page of the New York Times and every other newspaper in the, in the region. Um, so I, an uncomfortable situation to be in, but I, I think we came out as well as we could have done, really. Right. In the interest of time, before winding up, uh, 
from Anjum onwards. Um, one most memorable happy incident and uh, in your literature festival curation experience and one incident that you would wish to forget forever. Maybe, um, no, it's a, uh, I need to think a little bit, just straight off the bat, I think one of the most interesting and exciting uh, things that we managed to pull off that I still uh, feel is a great addition to the festival is roping in um, an, uh, an organization, INTAC, to work closely together to develop our heritage sites into interesting ambiances and atmospheres for the festival. So I think that's added a whole dimension to the experience because we are being able to rediscover these spaces which largely lie unvisited and you know the glory of some of the monuments of Calcutta come alive through the literary festival. So that's one good experience. And the one you wish to forget? You, you, do, you don't have any such, you're lucky. <laughs> Too many, maybe, but okay. yeah, we'll okay. mostly to do with logistics and okay. organization, so it's boring. Okay. <laughs> Nirvila? I think similarly, uh, most of our nightmares were, uh, you know, sort of based on the logistical failures that we experienced over the last, maybe last year was okay, but the year before that, we had, uh, you know, people coming at the wrong times. I think one terrible thing we did, uh, we forgot to say when it started, the time wow. of the first day of the first wow. session. <laughs> so we had angry uh, people, including readers, saying, when is this uh, damn show beginning? So <laughs> that was a terrible mistake. Uh, I think uh, two of the highlights, actually one year, more than we, what we expected, we had a workshop on translation and William talked about uh, you know, the appeal of um, Indian languages and um, people's interest in you know, Dalit literature and otherwise. And we had such a roaring session, it was unforgettable. We had people who hadn't signed on for the workshop thronging the halls and um, you know, it just went on for two hours, uh, you know, causing us a lot of other administrative problems, but that was wonderful. The other thing was uh, Vikram Seth on the first year, second year. Wow. He was a star because he just went on stage and performed and he declaimed and uh, we had to keep filling his uh, glass of wine, of course, but <laughs> it was just absolutely wonderful and the audience just stood up and um, you know, applauded him okay. Okay. and it never stopped. So okay. that was wonderful. Great. In, in one think, minute, please. <laughs> yeah, I think 2008, um, when there was a moment when we had, when the Oscars were announced, and it, uh, uh, it was um, Slumdog Year, and we had with us not only Gulzar and Vikas Swaroop, but also Ian McEwan and Christopher Hampton, who'd done the other one, Atonement, which was up for... Uh, so we had, uh, you know, here we were sitting in a, in a provincial town on the other side of the world, but we had... Uh, with us that particular moment, almost everyone, uh, the, the serious entries for the Oscars, were already at the festival. We'd sort of guessed it right. Yeah. And it was the year that Jaipur suddenly became packed. Uh, it was 2008, and, I, and we went on stage to announce the Oscar. In fact, that there, was, that there were these big Indian um, presents in the Oscar shortlist. Um, and it was about 9 o'clock at night, and the entire lawns, mm were packed, and I remember just saying to Namata, just look, we, look what we've done, what, what's, what's happened here, look at it, it's absolutely packed with young people. Uh, and the fact that people were turning up to listen to literature, and, uh, and were there at nine o'clock at night, still packed. Uh. Well, on that happy note, I think we've had a very uh, enlightening discussion. I, in the interest of time, I throw it open to question and answer for five minutes, about four questions each, please. Yeah, not each. On this uh, festival, and Thanks. specifically because you have a mix of um, commercial as well as literary writers, Thanks, and that's Pierre. the question that I was coming to. And Mr. Dalrymple, I just want to pose it to you. This uh, it's a great uh, festival that you have, but you seem to be ignoring commercial Indian writers writing in English. And uh, why I'm saying that is because that's a big grouse that one hears among the people who are actually selling books in large numbers. Writing in English and selling books, you may say that, they, that English is a little iffy, but still, they are writing in English yeah. and they are selling. It's commercial fiction. So right, right. Can you tell yeah. us why? We are primarily a literary festival and we are uh, overwhelmingly um, about uh, literary fiction rather than commercial fiction. But we've always had um, uh, uh, commercial fiction there. We, every, every year we have some form of chick lit session. Uh, every year we've had, um, uh, we've had all, I mean, all, the, all the major commercial... Um, Amish Tripathi before he was famous. Um, uh, all, the, all, the, all the big commercial writers have been... Uh, Chetan Bhagat has been three times and is a huge champion of the festival. Uh, and, I, and I agree, I think literary festivals should be inclusive. I think, I mean, 
by the nature of it, the, 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 there is less to say about a commercial novel than there is about a, a work of Shakespeare. Um, and, uh, and, you, and I think it's right to give less time to commercial fiction than it is to literary fiction, particularly as they get less, it, it has less space in the literary page, you know, the, the, out there, commercial fiction dominates bookshops, it dominates marketing campaigns. So in a sense, literary festivals should be the place where you give balance to the unheard of author from, from, from a small town writing in a difficult language. Uh, but we've had, no, we have had Amish Chetan and all the big uh, commercial writers. Isn't that an elitist point of view? Isn't that an elitist point of view saying... I, I think it would be elitist if we were excluding commercial fiction, but we're not. You do actually exclude uh, to a large extent. I mean, the names that you are named are just few and far between. There's just, just two or three. There's a whole bunch of them out there. And, 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 and I know for a fact there are many people who are selling as much as those two or three people that you have named, and they have never been invited. And, and they have been totally ignored, even though that they have kind of, uh, you know, expressed their desire to be there, a part of the festival. Well, as I say, you have to take up the, the Indian end of the invitations with my, uh, with my co-director, Namata, who, who issues them. I, I'm in charge only of Firangs. Um, okay, but but uh, I think that's, that's valuable. <laughs> I'm, I'm the Gora Corner. <laughs> that's valuable feedback back for Namita. Uh, the next question, please. Thanks, Piyush. Yeah, there's, there's someone there. Yeah. Hi. Uh, William, Anjum, and Nirmala, uh, all three of you host your literature festivals in the month of January. Uh, my question is, would it be possible to stagger it during the year so that all of us who are festival goers can come to all three of them? Wow. That's a great okay, suggestion. Who goes first on that one? Uh, my, uh, okay, our answer is simple. Uh, firstly, Calcutta is a city which you would not want to visit in most other parts of the year. The best time is the winter period. <laughs> Secondly, very importantly, we do a kind of piggyback with, uh, very yeah. frankly, with the Jaipur festival. Because, and there's a reason for that, logistical reason, which is that if you have, are inviting people who are coming from long distances, and if they are coming to uh, India for a short spell, they don't want to keep repeating their trips. And if you, uh, very often we find that if we try and program it at any other time of the year, you have a, a negative answer. Whereas if you try and do it so that they can do two or three festivals, and I think this is, it, it's a common sense answer that most festival organizers would have. They can benefit from being able, I'm talking about writers as opposed to the audience. Um, Is it yeah. worth to get an opinion poll to see uh, whether, uh, you know, they, you'd have much larger numbers if you did stagger it, though? Um, I don't think that's uh, really feasible. You can run a, uh, an opinion poll through one of these marketing agencies. But I think, by and large, from our experience, I agree with Anjum, that we have this great musical show going on in Chennai in December, music, dance, performance, that draws a lot of uh, Indians who live abroad, diaspora Indians who come to the city. And we want to make sure that they kind of flow into this as well. And um, as she said, we also, I mean, uh, the actual dates of Jaipur are often not told till the very end. So we always wait with bated breath to <laughs> see what William's up to. And then we tag on to that. And uh, like she said, it makes economic sense as well for people who come to kind of move in between cities and for authors as well. Hmm. William has yeah, already I, I think declared... I think you okay. should give others a chance. Sorry, we could always have a discussion later. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm also the, uh, you know, in charge of the festival, so I should keep time uh, because that'll, that's going to have a cascading effect. <laughs> the, last, the last question, please. Anyone? Yeah. Um, hello. Yeah. Uh, I think one of the most excellent things about literary festivals in India is that uh, we have a presence of Pakistani writers because a lot of Indians don't have the opportunity to uh, listen to a Pakistani outside of what... Uh, outside of newspapers and TV channels. Yeah. And the fact that literary festivals are making an attempt to bring writers, not just Mohsin Hamid, but even people like Nadeem yeah. Aslam lately. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a fantastic contribution and I hope all of you continue to bring more writers from Pakistan. Yeah. We'll surely keep that in mind. We had a, um, after the Bombay attacks, uh, we had a lot of pressure put on us by both um, state government, central government and local political groups to disinvite our, our uh, Pakistani authors. Uh, there was, um, at this point, all Pakistani authors being taken out of the 
windows and shelves of bookshops in Bombay uh, under pressure from the Shiv Sena. Uh, and uh, a whole, a whole uh, cultural program in Bombay had been cancelled of, of Pakistani writers. And, and we resisted that pressure. Uh, and in fact, doubled the number of Pakistani writers uh, on the basis that uh, um, it, it, this is exactly the moment you need dialogue. Yeah. Yeah. And we've just made a start by having Baba Rayaz and Meera Hashmi in, in the festival this time. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I think it's, it's probably one of the questions that came up, maybe a consortium of literature festivals of India and having one probably, uh, you know, all literature festivals participating and sending their programming content. That could be a pride for the whole country. Maybe that's the new million flower uh, project that could bloom. Thank you so much.